Um, I would like to start, uh, like many others have done uh, um, in these days, uh, by uh, remembering once again Marielle Franco. Um, <laughs> Today I was uh, having a long conversation on the Argentinian feminist movement with uh, uh, an Argentinian comrade, uh, Lucia, who at a certain point told me we, we feel the, kill, the assassination of Mariel Franco as something that really touches, touches us prof profoundly or in Argentina as well, because the attack on Mariel uh, was not just the killing of an individual, it was uh, an, a direct attack against uh, the process of uh, feminist insurgency in Latin America. So it was an attack against all of us. Uh, I, th I think this is true. And I think that uh, Marielle Franco uh, personified um, the, what the, in Argentina uh, the, uh, uh, the feminist activists uh, call uh, uh, popular feminism, feminismo popular, uh, what we have called in the United States the feminist for the 99% which is not the feminist of the Hillary Clinton or of the fancy CEOs or uh, Hollywood stars. Uh, it is the feminism of the of working class women, of indigenous women, of black women. It is anti-racist, uh, anti-capitalist, queer and trans feminism. Uh, and in, it is in the spirit of this feminism that I'm going to present um, this, uh, uh, this speech today. Um, trying to honor in this way by continuing the work of uh, theoretical reflection and political activism and political mobilization, trying to continue the work uh, and the legacy of uh, Marielle Franco. In, um, in the past weeks, uh, we have seen in the United States, and I want to start from uh, this positive note, uh, the beginning of what is potentially, and I underline potentially, uh, a historic uh, uh, strike wave. Uh, I say potentially because we don't know whether this is uh, going to actually happen, but clearly the uh, West Virginia strikes, the strike, uh, uh, the, teacher, the teacher strike in West Virginia of some weeks ago marked a possible historic turning point in labor organizing, labor struggle in the United States. Uh, this because uh, uh, the, the strike uh, under the impulse uh, from below of uh, rank and filers, um, defied uh, the uh, labor laws uh, which are uh, uh, in place in the United States, but also because uh, uh, the teachers on strike rejected collectively the first attempt by the union leadership to reach an agreement with the state's uh, administration. So this was a really a historic uh, moment potentially uh, with a, the potentiality of, of uh, uh, giving impulse to uh, a wave of uh, teacher strikes and uh, strikes in the states. For example, there is uh, the possibility of yet another teacher strike in another labor, uh, uh, right to labor state, uh, with, uh, which is Oklahoma. Um, but what is also interesting and what is uh, really worth examining uh, and uh, what I want to focus on today is the fact that uh, uh, perhaps not by chance. This was a strike that took place uh, in what uh, Marxist feminists call uh, the sphere of social reproduction, so uh, in the sphere of education in this case. It was a strike that uh, uh, was raising demands uh, concerning wages, but also larger demands concerning access to health care and the quality of, it, of public education. So, um, and what we can see not only in the States, but around the world, is a, a multiplication of, uh, str of uh, strikes and struggles that are taking place in the sphere of social reproduction. So I think that it's worth uh, pausing a moment on this, uh, on, on this issue and uh, trying to understand uh, the re what, so what is social reproduction, uh, what relation uh, social reproduction has with feminism and women's oppression, and uh, uh, what, what it means to rethink of class struggle uh, taking into account social reproduction. So I'm going to, to uh, very briefly and a bit schematically say a few words about uh, uh, the notion of social reproduction based on an elaboration of, uh, of Marx's Capital. I, I will be also very brief about this also because uh, David Harvey yesterday already 
uh, introduced the topic and, uh, and said several things on, the, on this. Um, but in order to understand what the social reproduction is, we should start from that very peculiar, very strange, we may also say queer commodity, which is labor power. Uh, Marx insists several times on the fact that uh, this is a strange, it's a commodity, but it's a strange one. Um, so why is this a strange commodity? Um, we may identify three reasons for this, or three features. The first, clearly, is the fact that uh, this commodity has the very strange power of producing more value than uh, the value that is necessary to its own reproduction. Uh, here lies, of course, the uh, uh, hidden secret of capital, uh, uh, you know, capitalist accumulation. Uh, here is where uh, capitalists uh, ultimately uh, take their profits from. The second reason, and this is uh, very interesting from the viewpoint of social reproduction, is that this is a, uh, in, in, uh, in, insofar it is a capacity, uh, this capacity cannot be really separated from the indiv living individuals who are its bearers. And this, of course, uh, already causes some trouble from the, for the capitalist. Why? Because uh, the capitalists uh, need labor power to make profits, but they cannot get labor power without the worker. Uh, and uh, this introduces uh, in the very process of production uh, and process of extraction, ex ex extortion of value uh, and surplus value introduces the very possibility of conflict. Why? Because uh, capitalists need to deal with living individuals who therefore also have agency. At the very least, the potentiality of uh, acting as a class, as a collective class. The third reason why uh, labor power is a strange commodity, so something different from a table or a chair or, uh, uh, or uh, um, apples produced industrially, is that uh, uh, contrary to other commodities, commodities, labor power is reproduced largely, not entirely, but largely outside the immediate production process. So uh, not uh, always in a coherent way, Marx uses uh, the term uh, reproduction in order to uh, address the production of this uh, weird queer commodity. Um, so for example, in chapter 23 of Capital in the, in, in the English edition, he writes, the maintenance and reproduction of the working class is and must ever be a necessary condition to the reproduction of capital. But the capitalist may safely leave its fulfillment to the laborers, uh, laborers' instincts of self-preservation and propagation. All the capitalist cares for is to reduce the laborer's individual consumption as far as possible to what is strictly necessary. So in other words, uh, of course there are also cases in which uh, it is not that easy to distinguish be between the immediate productive process and the social reproduction of the worker. But this, Marx says, is, not, is rather the exception than the norm because actually capitalists can, uh, um, can rely on the fact that they clearly human beings want to survive, want to reproduce themselves, want to live. It's, it's a, reproducing the uh, labor power means reproducing life, the life of living individuals. Uh, so they can safely uh, delegate this to, the, to people's desire to live. So while the first feature, the fact that uh, labor power produces more value than what is necessary for its own reproduction uh, is key to understanding exploitation and capital accumulation, uh, the, the, uh, the second and third features are also key to understanding what uh, uh, social reproduction is and uh, uh, why social reproduction is vital, is a vital part of, uh, of, of capitalism and capitalist reproduction. So on this point, first of all, uh, we should note that uh, when we speak of uh, the reproduction of labor power, we are not speaking simply of uh, the reproduction of an individual worker's labor power or an individual worker's uh, existence and life. Uh, Marx uh, uh, clarifies that uh, we need to speak of the reproduction of the working class as a whole. So this includes also future workers. Moreover, uh, labor power is uh, both physical and mental uh, and also the life of individuals uh, have to do with uh, something more than just uh, biological uh, reproduction, survival. Uh, which means that the reproduction of uh, labor power includes not only means of subsistence, food, housing, access to energy, clothing, and so on and so on, uh, 
but it, it includes also a set of activities that socialize labor power. So that actually reproduce a number of skills and aptitudes that make labor power sellable on the market. Um, in fact, Marx explicitly speaks of, the, of labor power not just as the capacity to work, but also as a set of specific aptitudes and skills uh, and disposition, dispositions, which means that uh, uh, reproducing labor power means also reproducing uh, uh, people who do have uh, uh, an aptitude and, uh, and uh, disposition that, is, uh, uh, that makes them uh, uh, um, uh, wageable, let's say, <laughs> in the sense that uh, makes their labor power uh, uh, sellable uh, as a commodity on the labor market. Um, so this is why in, usually in the notion of, in the Marxist feminist notion of uh, social reproduction, uh, we also include uh, uh, not just uh, the biological and physical reproduction of, uh, of workers and their families and so on, but also uh, socialization and education. So this is why I mentioned at the beginning the teacher strike as a strike uh, within social reproduction. Um, we can therefore distinguish three uh, kinds of uh, social reproduction. The biological sexual reproduction of the uh, labor power, uh, the daily reproduction of the mental and physical abilities of workers, but also the intergenerational reproduction of uh, labor power through which future workers are both uh, physically reproduced and socialized. So in more concrete terms, social reproduction includes care work, but not just care work, uh, includes education, includes sexuality, as well as the social relations uh, and labor that regulate the, the access to means of uh, subsistence uh, or self-maintenance, uh, from housing to food to energy to healthcare. Um, while being largely outside the uh, immediate productive process, social reproduction is also, uh, and this is a key point, internal to the circuit of capital's reproduction. Um, first of all, social reproduction uh, should not be conflated just with domestic labor, domestic work. It doesn't just take place within the household. Uh, it, it also takes place within the commodities market and also through state service, public services, uh, state inter institutions. Uh, moreover, virtually all, uh, in theory at least, virtually all socially reproductive activities can be commodified. This doesn't happen in practice, so this is not what happens in practice, uh, but there is no abstract uh, reason um, why these activities could not be commodified. And as a matter of fact, we are also seeing under neoliberal capitalism uh, an increasing process of commodification of uh, social reproductive activities uh, from uh, child bearing and child care, sex work, uh, cooking, cleaning, affective labor, care for the elderly and the sick and so on. As a matter of fact, one of the features of, the, uh, of ne neoliberal capitalism is precisely the increasing uh, commodification uh, of uh, uh, socially reproductive areas, such as uh, biological reproduction, uh, which were previously not directly commodified, but that are all uh, now uh, partially commodified, for example, through the phenomenon of uh, commercial surrogacy. Again, uh, this doesn't mean that we are uh, now entering a phase in which uh, all uh, social reproduction activities are uh, commodified. Uh, it means just that, that there is always uh, uh, an element of uh, fluidity and flexibility between the non-commodified and commodified socially reproductive activity. And the, the boundary is, uh, is a flexible boundary uh, that depends on uh, contingent reasons. Um, secondly, even when uh, it takes place uh, outside the formal labor market uh, through, for example, women's unwaged work, social reproduction is uh, anyway subject to the pressures of cap capitalist accumulation. On the one hand, uh, wages, income, but also the concrete organization of the labor process, uh, for example, with the time constraints that it poses on uh, people's lives, uh, uh, limits, uh, limit and determines uh, in a fundamental way the range of uh, reproductive str strategies that are available to people. 
um, which means that social reproduction is constitutively shaped by class relations. So uh, my wage, the type of work I, I have, uh, the, ta the, the kind of labor organization, uh, uh, sorry, of organization of the labor process and so on, of course have uh, an immediate impact on uh, what I can credibly do in order to reproduce myself, my family, uh, and so on. On the other hand, uh, uh, insofar as people are expropriated from uh, uh, direct access to means of su sustenance, their access to means of reproduction is, of course, mediated through wage and commodities. And therefore, it is internal to the circuit of uh, capital's reproduction because, of course, it's part of the realization of value. Finally, um, as, I, uh, in, as we have seen in Marx's passage, we have seen uh, uh, earlier, all capital is scarce uh, in the last instance is to uh, decrease as much as possible the cost of social reproduction. So uh, decrease uh, the laborers' individual consumption as much as possible. <coughs> of, course, of, of course, this must be understood uh, as historically determined. So what one understands as the minimum uh, of individual consumption changes historically. Um, but this uh, means that uh, capitalism, under capitalism, uh, social reproduction is necessarily subordinated to production of value. Uh, so to production for profits, which is another way to say that use value is subordinated to exchange value or to value, and that people's needs and lives are subordinated to the imperative of the accumulation of profits. Now, what does this have to do with feminists or we women? So here I want to be a, a bit polemic, um, because there is, a, uh, there is a strange view, in my view, uh, let's say what I consider an empirically counterintuitive uh, view, that uh, somehow um, sees an agreement, a very weird agreement between uh, supporters, enthusiastic supporters of capitalism, mainstream liberal feminists, who are also sympathetic to capitalism, and some reductionist Marxist. Um, so the thesis on which they unwittingly agree upon is uh, runs a bit as follows. Uh, I call this in, uh, in, uh, in an article I wrote, uh, the indifferent capitalism thesis. So in other words, the thesis is uh, women's oppression, of course, is a problem, but uh, uh, is a remnant of a pre-capitalist past so it's a remnant of patriarchal, uh, a patriarchal system um, where uh, it was rooted uh, in uh, the patriarchal relations organizing uh, both production and the distribution of goods within agrarian societies. Uh, it is rooted in traditional worldviews, the influence of the church uh, or other religious uh, currents, uh, religious traditional beliefs and so on. However, under capitalism, capitalism, we have seen enormous progress for women. Why is this the case? Because, uh, first of all, capitalism has a tendency to revolutionize technology. So, for example, now we have washing machines, <laughs> which is true. I mean, like, uh, you may try to wash uh, uh, bed sheets by hand. It's, it's very hard work <laughs> and time consuming. But also capitalism has the tendency to dissolve uh, Tra traditional social relations and kinship ties um, to indif indifferently commodify all, all labor power because precisely labor power must be uh, somehow considered by capitalism as uh, uh, free and equal. And uh, capitalism has also a tendency to valorize uh, uh, individuality and personhood, which offers the ideological uh, grounds for uh, challenging and questioning traditional beliefs. Uh, in wor in worst-case scenarios, capitalism uh, opportunistically uses uh, traditional forms of gender oppression for its own purposes. For example, uh, the purpose of uh, exploiting sexism uh, in order to maintain hierarchies or to fill hierarchies within uh, the division of labor. But this is a contingent phenomenon. Uh, in abstract, capitalists could dispense with this, 
It could replace women's oppression with something else, and so on and so on. Um, now, I don't have uh, the time to, uh, um, to explain in detail why all of this is wrong. But uh, um, I want to uh, somehow, uh, also a bit of a, as a joke, to refer to a recent document published by the World Economic Forum, which is not exactly an enemy of capitalism. The World Economic Forum this, uh, said that uh, at this pace, it will take 217 years to fill the gender pay gap and overcome disparities in, in employment opportunities. By the way, these are 47 years uh, more than what was calculated in 2016. Uh, so they realized they had made some mistake. Uh, which means maybe ne next year we will discover that actually maybe 300 years. Uh, but look, if we wait patiently, we will arrive there. Now, gender pay gap, of course, it doesn't exist in a social void. So it's not that uh, there is a gender pay gap in the formal labor market, but then in the rest of society, there is you know, great gender parity and equality and so on. If, if it is possible for gender pay gap to exist in the formal labor market, this is why there is an organic relation with uh, gender hierarchies that are existing more generally within society. So I don't know how credible these calculations are. Maybe the methods used are not uh, reliable and so on, but. Uh, uh, the reason why I was uh, referring to this is that even from the viewpoint of, you know, people who actually like capitalism, um, there seems to be a problem uh, when it comes to uh, gender equality under capitalism. So in other words, it is not really true <laughs> that uh, uh, the natural tendency of capitalism is to overcome gender oppression. So. If this is true empirically, then uh, we may also try to find, uh, theoretically, some reasons why this is the case. Um, social reproduction tries to do this. Um, let's say that uh, um, the, the, uh, the idea of social reproduction is that, uh, of course, uh, gender oppression, women's oppression, pre-existed capitalism. This is an obvious historical fact. It was not universal contrary to what radicalism, uh, radical feminism has claimed. Uh, it was not present in a number of uh, classless societies, but clearly it largely uh, pre uh, predates capitalism. However, the question is whether the current form of uh, women's oppression is the same as the one that was uh, in place um, in patriarchal so agrarian societies. Um, so social reproduction theory says, actually, um, of course, there are a number of uh, you know, traditional aspects of uh, gender oppression that, has been, that have been uh, uh, co-opted and reshaped by capitalism or within capitalist societies. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are some feature, features of capitalist accumulation of the way uh, capitalism uh, reproduction works that uh, directly produce and reproduce uh, women's oppression. This is not a functionalist argument. So the idea is not that there is a plan uh, that uh, uh, capitalists uh, you know, on purpose create, you know, like they're sitting on a, around the table and creating uh, women's oppression because this serves a purpose. That's not uh, uh, what we are claiming. What we are claiming is that uh, there are some uh, impersonal uh, uh, fundamental dynamics of uh, capitalist reproduction that have as consequence the uh, reproduction of uh, women's oppression. And of course, this is also quite useful for a number of capitalists. Um, one of the main points, for example, is that, uh, um, as I said earlier, social reproduction is necessarily, under capitalism, subordinated to production of value. So to the imperative of uh, uh, profit or value ext extortion. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, this means that uh, there is a constant pressure to uh, decrease the cost of social reproduction. This has concrete effects 
in terms of women's labor. First of all, uh, this pressure tends to reinforce gender roles within a heteronormative framework. Why? Because this has uh, the effect of uh, um, loading women and feminized people with the burden of unwage reproductive work and, uh, and to make this socially acceptable, even normal. The second is that uh, uh, um, this pressure tends to squeeze the indirect uh, and socialized wage that the working class receives, uh, for example, in the form of public services, education, and healthcare. Um, this uh, means, uh, of course, uh, 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 cuts to the funds and, of, and, and therefore limitation of access to public services and so on. But it also means a constant attack to, uh, especially in, the, in uh, recent decades, uh, to labor conditions and uh, wage levels uh, within the social productive sphere. So it is not by chance that the sector of social reproduction, or the, the sector of care within social reproduction, predominantly employs feminized and racialized workers. So for example, massively migrant labor. Um, we are also saying, uh, seeing an increase in the process of proletarianization of what uh, was, uh, uh, and, and uh, we had some discussion about this in, the, in, uh, in, uh, in these days, uh, proletarianization of a series of a, uh, of a set of uh, uh, social re socially reproductive workers like teachers who uh, used to enjoy better uh, 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 labor conditions but are now everywhere under attack. Um, Moreover, the consequence, the fact that uh, uh, a big part, not entirely, but a big part of the socially reproductive work is performed as unwaged labor, and especially by women uh, within the household, means that also that uh, then uh, reproductive labor in the formal labor market uh, tends to be treated as uh, cheap and to be devalued. Uh, just to give some examples, um, in a recent book in the name of women's rights, um, Sarah Farris, for example, examines uh, what she calls the political economy of femonationalism. Uh, so basically she looks at the, um, at the intertwinement of uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, ideology of, of integration, uh, uh, Islamophobia, um, migration policies and what is happening in the sector of care. And what she noticed is that uh, since 2018, the number of uh, the employment of migrant worker, workers, and especially women, in the domestic and care sector has not decreased. So it does not suffer from the crisis. Um, and instead is on the rise, so it is increasing, with migration policies and political discourses that have tended to facilitate the import of uh, racialized, racialized and gender cheap uh, care labor to fill needs in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a service sector that is uh, traditionally and also in large part constitutively labor, very labor intensive and, and very low in productivity. So just to sum up, the, uh, the key of the issue is that capitalism does need the social reproduction of the working class and of society as a whole, uh, social reproduction is a necessary part, constitutive part of capital's expanded reproduction. So it is part of the realization process. But this reproduction also bears cost that capitalists are not very keen on paying for. Uh, this contradiction is, uh, uh, which has already serious consequence for consequences for women's lives, is further exacerbated by the ecological crisis for a number of reasons that I don't have the, 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 the time to detail. But for example, uh, there are some calculations that uh, by 2050, the number of climate refugees uh, could reach 150 million, and that 80% of climate refugees will be women and children. And this has to do with the fact that uh, uh, in a number of countries, uh, women are also uh, mostly employed in uh, 
self-sustenance agriculture. That is, uh, so which means they have low mobility and very high morbidity and they're uh, uh, constitutively more exposed to uh, climate and ecological catastrophes. Um, so if uh, I had also a, a small part on sexuality, but we, I, leave, I will leave this for the discussion, no? no, okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> so I wanted to speak on the strike, but okay, but I will say a few words on this. As I said, social reproduction also has a role in organizing sexuality. And to be a bit quick about this, uh, I will just uh, limit myself to uh, quote um, a recent work by Alan Sears, um, precisely on the relation between sexuality and social reproduction. And he has an interesting point. Um, so first of all, Alan Sears, uh, and he's not, of course he's not the first one who, says, who said this, uh, but uh, you know, emphasizes the fact that uh, Sexuality as a distinct realm of a human activity, separated um, from reproduction and uh, as constitutive uh, of personal identities, uh, only emerges under capitalism. So it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, so, but his point is this, so there might be a, a mistake in the sense that uh, one may see uh, the proliferation and increasing visibility of, uh, sex of various and uh, varied sexual identities as just uh, a symptom of increased individual freedom, so as just some, as something positive. And of course, there is a, a positive element in this. And there is also uh, a sense in which the increase of uh, sexual identities is, creates new sites of struggle. Um, at the same time, uh, he says, uh, we, may, we may look at, the, at this uh, issue in the way in which Marx uh, looks at the issue of uh, uh, workers' uh, freedom under capitalism. Marx uh, famously in, uh, in Capital, in volume one, says, uh, uh, you know, parodying, of course, liberal thought, um, says uh, uh, workers are endowed with a paradoxical uh, double freedom. Of course, you know, they, they meet capitalists uh, with, you know, in the contract, in the sphere of, uh, of circulation and so on, as uh, free and equal individuals. Uh, so they, uh, in this sense, they're free. But at the same, which, which means they have the freedom of, freedom of dispose of their own bodies. So they have the freedom to sell their labor power. However, there is a little problem. They're not just free to sell their labor power, they're also forced to sell their labor power because there is another sense of freedom which is uh, misery. So freedom from means of production, being deprived of means of production, that is dispossession. Um, now Alan Sears proposes to apply the same logic to understand the paradoxical sexual freedom under uh, uh, capitalism. Um, so I, I'm going to, to read a little quote. Uh, capitalism prepared the ground for the rise of forms of sexuality that combine freedom with compulsion. Freedom of sexuality under capitalism is based on the social reproduction of uh, free labor. As the working class under capitalism is distinguished, uh, is distinguished from other subordinate classes through history in that workers can lay claim to formal ownership of their own bodies. And in this way, they, of course, they, this is also the outcome of struggles, they can also lay claim uh, to formal ownership of the, their sexuality or their, their sexual identities or uh, orientation. Yet, the freedom of labor based on self-ownership is necessarily combined with forms of compulsion. So, which means that this sexual freedom uh, and proliferation of sexual identity is also subject to the very same pressures coming from, uh, uh, that I was talking about, coming from capitalist uh, uh, accumulation. Not by chance, for example, we have seen uh, in recent decades uh, a process of somehow of normalization of uh, gay identities um, and formation of uh, uh, gay middle class that uh, uh, represents a form of, of sexual identities that is more uh, acceptable from the viewpoint of capitalism than, uh, uh, than uh, queer identities uh, or, the other for, or the way in which uh, uh, LGBT identities uh, 
um, affirm themselves at the beginning of the gay liberation movement as transgressive, as uh, questioning the social order, the heteronormative order, and so on. So in other words, uh, there is, there is a, a capacity of capitalism to accommodate certain kinds of uh, um, gender nonconformity and, uh, 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 and gay and lesbian uh, sexual identity insofar as uh, they uh, still um, reproduce a model of social reproduction, for example, the recreation of the nuclear family uh, uh, that reproduces in the same way in which the heteronormative or heterosexual family uh, reproduces. Uh, and in this way, it doesn't challenge uh, the, uh, uh, the, the role of that social reproduction plays under capitalism. Now, um, what, do all of, what does all of this mean from the viewpoint of feminist politics uh, and of class politics? Now, uh, I want to make, uh, and I, I don't want to be too long because I want to have also some time for debate, especially because here, especially in Argentina, there is uh, what I consider uh, probably the, 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 the feminist movement that represents the political and social uh, vanguard, if I can use this old-fashioned term, of the feminist movement globally. Um, but I want to make uh, a couple of points. Uh, uh, one concerning uh, how to rethink of feminist struggle from the viewpoint of social reproduction. But the second is also how to rethink of class struggle and what class means from the point of view of social reproduction. Um, now, um, this of course doesn't apply to Argentina where uh, uh, the tradition of uh, uh, popular feminism, of feminism popular, is actually, has been the dominant tradition uh, for decades, uh, while liberal feminism actually plays uh, a more marginal role. But uh, uh, for example, in Western Europe and uh, in the United States or Canada and so on, um, we have lived through uh, at least two or three decades in which feminist discourse has been entirely dominated by liberal feminism in various uh, versions. Um, this has uh, reached even uh, extremes uh, that have been named as uh, homonationalism and femonationalism which means uh, the adoption of uh, uh, some kind of feminist discourse or uh, gay liberation discourse uh, for the purpose of justifying uh, imperialist, uh, nationalist, uh, Islamophobic, xenophobic uh, uh, policies. The war in Afghanistan, for example, was uh, largely justified as, uh, uh, not only, but largely justified as uh, uh, a, great, a great moment of civilization and liberation of Afghani women. Uh, Israel uh, uh, usually, in, uh, in, uh, in recent years, has uh, uh, used, uh, as, you know, is regarding to images of uh, sexual modernity, sexual liberation, and so on, to um, legitimize itself as, again, the only democracy in the Middle East, um, in uh, opposition to these barbarian, barbarous, uh, barbarian Palestinians who oppress uh, gay people and women and so on. Not to speak, of course, the, of the Islamophobia in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, now, the, the problem of this is that uh, there is actually a sector of feminism that has accepted this, uh, this discourse, that has accepted this cooptation uh, uh, of uh, uh, feminist discourse uh, for nationalist uh, and Islamophobic purposes. Uh, it is sufficient to think of uh, the uh, debate on uh, the ban on the hijab uh, or burqa in, uh, in France, just to give an example of uh, this, the level of cooptation. And by the way, uh, I, I was at a, I was speaking at the, at the launch of the new translation of Women, Race, and Class of Angela Davis in Italy uh, a few days ago. Uh, and I said these things. I actually spoke of, of feminist allied with the state. Uh, somebody didn't like this. <laughs> but uh, uh, just to give uh, a sense of uh, the level of, uh, of pro problematism of this, uh, one of the feminists present in the, in the audience uh, very polemically asked, asked me, but who decides? whether uh, uh, the burqa or the burkini and so on should be allowed or not. 
was like, and why should I decide? I mean, I, I don't understand why should you decide? They're like, you are a white Italian uh, secular uh, woman. I, it's unclear to me why you should be the protagonist of this, like, of this decision. So, um, in front of this, of course, we do have, uh, um, especially again in Western Europe, in the United States, in Canada, and so on, we do, ha we do have the problem of uh, challenging, questioning the hegemony of this mainstream uh, 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 feminism, and also the co-optation of feminist discourse uh, by the state. From this viewpoint, I think that uh, the current international wave of feminist mobilizations, the current feminist movement, uh, is challenging both through its practice, to its, its, through its concrete practice, and through its political and theoretical elaborations, um, this form of mainstream feminism that had also led uh, in, uh, for example, in, in, in I don't know here, but certainly in the United States, for example, to a very simplistic uh, opposition between uh, what counts as uh, class politics and what counts as uh, so-called identity politics. Uh, this, again, has been also the outcome of uh, a retreat from class of mainstream feminism. Now, I think that uh, the the force, the power of, uh, of this uh, new feminist movement, international feminist movement, is that it is uh, both challenging mainstream uh, liberal feminism, but also this uh, simplistic opposition that we find often also within Marxism, which, between uh, um, struggles based on uh, gender oppression uh, or uh, race, uh, racial oppression, so on, and uh, what we uh, label as class struggle. And I will say a few words on this. Now, first of all, the adoption of the strike internationally um, has meant not just the adoption of a form of struggle that uh, traditionally belonged to the workers' movement, but also uh, represents, in my view, a, um, a constitutive uh, element in a process of uh, politicization of the feminist movement. So it is not just, just a form of struggle, it is also a form of uh, political self-identification. Uh, why is this the case? Because it is impacting directly the way in which the women who participate in the movement see themselves as women and as workers at the same time, as women and as laborers, both wage and unwage workers. Um, which this, of course, changes the way they with the women participating in the movement increasingly interpret their, their relation uh, between uh, uh, their, con their own conditions of life and societies uh, at large. So social relations at large, and also the relation between uh, their oppression as women and uh, social relations more, uh, uh, um, more uh, comprehensively, and especially capitalism. So women's strike have aimed at empowering women, by making their labor visible, uh, both waged and unwaged labor, and by asserting that precisely because uh, uh, the reproduction of uh, societies and, and, uh, of life uh, uh, depends on women's labor, uh, women do have some power. They're not just victims. They're not just victims of, of oppression. They're, all, they're also the bearer of the labor power that, uh, for a number of historical and social reasons, uh, uh, mostly reproduces life. Um, this practice, uh, uh, the adoption of the strike, has also required, of course, broadening the notion of, uh, uh, of strike. Why? Be in order to allow the participation in the strike of women who are unwaged, uh, so, for example, who only work in the household, uh, women, uh, precarized women, who do not have uh, labor organization, labor rights, unemployed women, undocumented uh, migrant women. So in a number of countries, uh, uh, women's strikes have included not just the strikes uh, called by unions in the workplace, but also strikes from unwaged social reproductive work, which had, of course, uh, more of a symbolic political meaning, but uh, that contributed to this, to this process of uh, 
let's say, subject formation within the feminist movement. Part time strikes, uh, calls to employers to close business earlier, uh, boycotts, and so on and so on. Um, so, this, uh, the practice of the strike, uh, as I said, I think responds also to, to the emergence of a new generation of uh, feminist activists who have, in a number of countries, uh, witnessed the limitations of liberal and mainstream feminism. Why? Because uh, I will give you just the example of Italy. In Italy, uh, feminism in the last uh, 25 years has been uh, dominated by differentialist, essentialist feminism that uh, scarcely de dealt with issues of class. And just to give you an example, uh, one of the main uh, actors uh, public actors of this uh, uh, of uh, feminist uh, Italian feminism, traditional Italian feminist feminism. Sorry, um, a few years ago produced uh, a document uh, supporting uh, the resort to part-time work for women, so that women could say a double yes to work and maternity. Now. 80% uh, of uh, part-time workers in Italy are women. And uh, the last uh, calculations of uh, ISTAT, which is this, uh, anyway, uh, last, you know, recent calculations uh, basically speak of the of, uh, future of uh, extreme poverty in old age for women, precisely because of the enormous impact of part-time work among women. Um, so what we are seeing, for example, in Italy well, is uh, the politicization of uh, a new generation of uh, women, very young women, who are either students or precarious workers, who have been uh, uh, really uh, uh, be the first victims of the two decades of neoliberal uh, precarization of, uh, of, uh, of work, who really don't have uh, uh, who really, in a sense, uh, um, whose conditions of life have deteriorated so much that uh, af this kind of feminism, who speaks about uh, what it means to be a woman, maternity as uh, the destiny of a woman, a woman's women's propensity to care and, uh, and being welcoming, and, and so on and so on, and double yes and so on, these women really don't have anything, I mean, they don't have any use for this. So this kind of feminist doesn't speak to their own uh, conditions of life. Uh, they have different kinds of problem, problems. For example, uh, the absolute abs absence of uh, perspectives for the future. The idea that uh, most likely they will be unemployed or they will jump from uh, work to, uh, to another. That they don't have access to abortion because uh, more than 80% of doctors uh, of uh, OBG in Italy are uh, objectors. Uh, so, which means for uh, moral reasons they cannot perform abortions, and so on and so on. So this is producing a new form of, uh, of uh, subjectivation of this uh, new generation of women uh, and the emergence of, uh, of a kind of feminism that uh, does not separate uh, the critique of sexism, uh, of uh, stereotypes in language, culture, and so on, from the critique of capitalism, of class relations, of war, uh, of uh, uh, racism, and so on and so on. Um, I think that this, of course, we dif you know, in different ways because each country has a different and specific dynamic, but I think that the, on an international level, uh, uh, this is a bit what is happening. So it is really the emergence of uh, uh, of a kind of feminism that uh, uh, starts from a partiality, it is, starts from a specific uh, uh, viewpoint on, uh, on, uh, um, on a specific uh, uh, condition of life to speak to the totality. So in other words, to actually criticize the totality of social relations. Uh, and that increasingly is identifying this totality with the capitalist totality. Now, um, another novelty of this uh, uh, new feminist movement uh, is the fact that uh, if, we, if we look historically, again, 
I'm speaking you know, with, uh, in very broad terms, so I'm using a, a lot of generalizations and uh, there are of course differences and so on uh, on a national level, but uh, uh, I'm speaking about the broad tendencies. But uh, um, uh, one of the features of the first and second wave of feminism is that uh, uh, they emerged both within uh, uh, large social mobilizations so in the context, uh, for example, of uh, the rising workers' movement, uh, the formation of uh, working class parties, uh, social big social democratic parties, uh, uh, the big unions and so on, or uh, the context of uh, uh, a process of radicalization and social activis activation between the 60s and the 70s uh, around uh, uh, national liberation struggles, uh, the new left, uh, 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 the students' movements, and so on and so on. So, within these large social mobilizations, uh, 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 there was also the, uh, the, the insurgency of uh, feminist movements. And uh, often also as a response to uh, the limitations of uh, these large movements to address the specific issues of uh, women's oppression. Uh, now, this is not our uh, scenario, generally speaking. Again, it depends on the countries, but I would say that uh, internationally, unfortunately, we are not in a phase of rising class trouble, uh, comparable to the moment of uh, uh, enormous class formation uh, uh, between 19th century and beginning of 20th century, or the large social mobilizations of uh, the 60s and 70s and so on. So in some countries, for example Italy, the feminist movement is the only mass social movement in place. This doesn't mean that there are no other struggles, for example also labor struggles, but in terms of massive social mobilization, this is the only movement in place. And this, the feminist movement is also the only movement that is attempting uh, at, uh, international organization. So, to recreate a form of uh, militant internationalism. Um, of course, this raises a number of challenges in a number of countries. So one of the challenges is uh, how are we going to sustain the feminist movement uh, in a context in which we are not in the process of ri you know, general rise of uh, class struggle. Um, but at the same time, I think that uh, uh, it opens uh, the possibility for uh, uh, a new process of class formation, or a new pro process of uh, uh, class recomposition, and also a redefinition of the political concept of class. So I'm going to very, in, in five minutes, to say some very, you know, to give some very grandiose statements that then we will uh, uh, discuss. I'm not sure there will be objections to this. Um, and I want to, re to go back to Marx in order to make this, uh, this point. Now, um, Clearly, we can consider class from a sociological uh, viewpoint as to use uh, um, an expression by Ellen Maxins Wood as you know, people who are placed uh, in uh, uh, class positions. So in other words, uh, we can speak of the, of, uh, of, uh, of the working class in terms of the proletariat, of the labor force, uh, and so on. And from a sociological viewpoint, clearly, the global working class is largely made, of, made up of uh, racialized people, women, uh, and uh, migrants. Uh, and this, of course, should raise some issues about, you know, then uh, uh, how the, this, uh, 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 this proletariat, uh, that is uh, racialized, migrant, feminized, and so on, constitutes itself into a political class. Uh, but for Marx, uh, class is also, and prevalently in my view, a different thing. Uh, in other words, class, uh, I mean, class, uh, Marx is a bit ambiguous in his uh, use of the term class, and this of course created all numbers of problems in, in the way in which then Marx is developed. But uh, in a number of passages in Marx's work, we can see that class is mostly a political concept. Uh, albeit, of course, it is a political concept that is, uh, and a political reality that is rooted in an economic and social reality, 
created by relations of production. So the working class exists in its collective antagonism against the capitalist class. Uh, in some passages, Marx is saying what, what a class is at any specific moment, uh, in his, moments in history, can only be seen in the way it struggles, can only ways be seen in its antag active antagonism uh, with the, with the uh, antagonist class, with the capitalist class. Uh, in the German ideology, speaking of the bourgeoisie, so not of the proletariat, Marx writes that, uh, I quote, uh, uh, the bourgeoisie's separate individuals form a class insofar as they have to carry on a common battle against another class. Otherwise, they are on hostile terms with each other as competitors. So the capitalist class becomes a class in its antagonism against the workers. Now, but the same largely holds for the working class. Uh, because workers uh, uh, enter the labor market as uh, uh, individual sellers of labor power who are, in a sense, you know, competition with each other. And in this competition, gender and race uh, hierarchies uh, play a key role. Um, so, for example, uh, already in, uh, in a letter from 1866, Marx writes of the First International, or the, the task of the First International, uh, as the task of giving sustenance and impetus, so facilitating, helping, the organization of the workers into a class. So the organization of the workers into a class. This is why I'm insisting that uh, class is mostly a political concept for Marx. Um, this means that class is not a static object, cannot be simply analyzed on the basis of its, uh, let's say, material, social, economic composition. It is a dynamic entity that is in a constant process of self-formation in antagonism with another class. So what does this have to do with feminine so and social reproduction? Um, as I said, Social reproduction uh, is mostly the is, is, is largely the place in which uh, not only the class re is reproduced and socialized, but also uh, the set of relations, activities, institutions that uh, um, that shape and give social meaning to different bodies. So that reproduce workers uh, not as homogeneous abstract workers, but as uh, workers that are, uh, di who are differentiated by class, uh, sorry, by gender, by race, by, by ethnicity, and so on and so on. Um, in other words, the class um, in its, uh, um, let's say, sociological reality doesn't exist as an homogeneous uh, subject. Um, so, if we have to repeat Marx's uh, question, then how, how are we going to help or facilitate, give impetus to the organization of this uh, differentiated, orga hierarchically organized workers into a class? Uh, then uh, we may uh, look at this issue starting from uh, looking at the way in which the class is struggling today. And today the class is struggling not only in the workplace, it is struggling uh, within social reproduction, uh, and it also struggling in a uh, set of workplaces that are socially reproductive workplaces. Uh, and in these struggles, very often, uh, not always, but very often, and this is happening within the feminist movement, uh, uh, the activation of, uh, uh, as a class, um, it is not uh, distinct from uh, the activation and uh, uh, subjectivation as uh, women, trans or cis women, uh, uh, queer people, uh, black people, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so we do have a proliferation of these kind of conflicts, but uh, um, the way we may start looking at it is not so much that there is a distinction between class struggle on the one hand, that is you know, economic struggle or struggle just on the workplace, and then other kinds of movements. But actually, we may see, we may look at the recent uh, uh, feminist movement and the, at the proliferation of the struggles within social reproduction as a constitutive uh, and internal uh, 
uh, process of class formation. So this is the way in a number of countries, not everywhere, uh, but in a number of countries, the class is forming itself as class, directly as uh, um, fighting not just on economic issues, on, uh, but you know, reconnecting uh, class exploitation uh, in the workplace to the multiple ways in which uh, capitalism, uh, cap you know, capitalist social relations uh, oppress people and differentiate them. Um, so the variety, uh, this variety of struggles, I think, is what should be welcome, which doesn't mean that we should not try to then uh, create alliances and uh, unity of struggle and solidarity and so on. But we should not do this uh, uh, by uh, uh, hanging on uh, fantasies of uh, a universal class as a homogeneous class. So in other words, just to be you know, more uh, trivial, the typical story that feminism or anti-racism divides the unity of the of class struggle, really, like, we should really drop this. Uh, really, like, it's boring. It doesn't speak to reality. It is just wrong. Uh, what divides the class are sexism, racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, and so on. This is what divides the class. How you respond to these divisions within the class is by fighting on these fronts and by facilitating a process, process of class formation, of class objectivation that takes into account these issues and doesn't divide the struggle on wages from the struggles against racism, xenophobia, uh, uh, gender uh, uh, pay inequality, and so on and so on. So a universal class is not a homogeneous class. Uh, a universal for Marx, Marx is not an empty universal. It is, uh, just to use a philosophical term, uh, a multiplicity of determinations, which means it is only by recombining in a process of class formation all the, these different aspects uh, that uh, we actually reach the formation of a universal class. Not as the homogeneous class that, by the way, usually has corresponded to the, you know, the typical male working class, uh, because the male working class is homogeneous. But when we speak about women works, then we are dividing the unity of, uh, of the struggle. Uh, so I think we should, uh, again, uh, aim to facilitate this process of uh, new class formation that is happening within the, form the feminist uh, movement as well by dropping this idea of a homogeneous class and by re-articulating what un a universal class means, uh, which means it is a class that uh, uh, fights on all fronts, uh, that recom recombines politically uh, the many experiences, needs, desires, forms of resistance that constitute it in its multiracial and multigender dimension. So uh, again, um, the feminists for the 99% uh, that, uh, that uh, we are trying, for example, to advance in the United States and elsewhere has precisely this kind of goal. So in other words, it's not the idea of adding to class struggle uh, feminist struggle. It is the idea of rethinking very deeply what class struggle and class mean. Thank you.